Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tracks, the official Avenged Sevenfold podcast, where we ordinarily are taking you through the Avenged Sevenfold back catalogue one song at a time. But this is a very special update podcast because a lot has happened in the world of Avenged over the course of the last few months. There's been the latest leg of the Life is Bird Dream Tour, the introduction of Avenged Sevenfold Season Pass, and an incredible step into the world of VR concerts. So, without any further BS from me, we caught up with M Shadows to discuss all of that and more. Plus, there's a chat with Matt and a Maze VR director, Lance Drake, about the new world of VR concerts and specifically the new event show, Looking Inside. So, I'm Bees and this is Tracks. <laughs> So another leg of tour down, Matt. How much fun was it this time? And uh, new songs in the set list? Like, how, what's your appraisal of the tour you've just done? It was one of the most enjoyable tours we've ever done. Um, I don't know why. It was just um, not a lot of stress. I felt really good about it. The set list was really fun because we were able to pull out, you know, I think one of the things that we were you always get worried about is dropping songs such as so far away or a little piece of heaven. I mean, those are behemoth sort of staples in our set list, you know, and it, and you just don't know what's going to happen when, um, when you drop something like that. And I, I think we just kind of said, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to play the stuff that we want to play things that we're a little bit sick of. We're just going to drop, um, and give them a little breather and leg three seemed like the perfect time to do that. Um, and then we were able to play things like save me and cosmic and, you know, blinded in chains and um, Roman Sky, which is an oddball song to play. And it was just really interesting to have these pockets of pure enjoyability during the set constantly because you were playing things that were not second nature and they were a little bit more, you know, keep you on the edge. Like you got to be on your game. Like you're not, you haven't done this song for 20 years. Um, so we we just had a great time. And And what was even more fulfilling was the fact that so many fans really got excited about it. And though we did get, you know, some pushback from people that were upset we didn't play some of the bigger songs, we got a lot more positive reaction, which I think goes more to where the music industry is going anyways, which is the fans that are fans are hardcore. They're not as fringe, right? Um, the music industry 10, 20 years ago was a lot more fringe because you had different drivers and you were hearing the same song on the radio or you might see the song on MTV, but you never really made yourself familiar with the rest of the records. We're in a point now where if somebody's investing their time and money to go see a band, they usually know the catalog, right? They know everything. And, but you still get that feeling of excitement when obscure deep track starts getting played. Um, and so that's a very exciting time to be alive and playing because you know you can kind of throw anything at the fans at this point and they're going to enjoy it if it's you know a little more off the beaten path mm. i thought it was maybe the best bit of the cameron crow pearl jam movie was when they were talking about the fact that when that band go on tour they pick their set list nightly and everyone who goes there sees that as a positive thing yeah that's very cool and you gotta you know i think dave matthews does something uh, like that where you got to have an audience that's willing to roll with it you can imagine a band that lives and dies by radio or MTV. If you don't go play the hit, you're going to have a lot of people that are pissed off at you and never want to see you again. But Avenged isn't that band. You know, there are those people and there's those shows where you can tell it's more of a radio audience. But most of the shows now, it's it's more compact. It's a lot more of a diehard sort of lifer. And they just want to hear things that they didn't expect to hear. Mm. I, I, I wasn't going to reference it, but as soon as you did, the conversation around the little piece of heaven being dropped must have been monolithic. You know what? We kind of freed ourselves from it, and we just... The, the bigger one was so far away, to be honest. Um, there's that... It's sort of that connection to Jimmy. There's like mm -hmm. this sort of um, cathartic moment during the live show. But when you look at the set, at some point, things need to go. And if you don't, you know, ever take them away, then you're never going to 
care when they come back because they were always there. And so, you know, that those songs obviously will come back at some point. But right now they're just taking a little breather. So festival shows coming up as well. Um, is there plenty of touring still to be done with Life is But a Dream as well? Because I, I guess that's the wider please come to my town side of things out there on planet Earth. Yeah, there is. You know, we even just had a call today of like some very unique things we want to do. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make not only the way that the music is released, but the type of music the type of festivals, the type of places we play, the type of merch, every single thing we want to kind of live in this world where it all feels unique. So we have finished up the part of our cycle where we've kind of checked some boxes, but we do have to go to Europe. So I know everyone will go, oh, you didn't go to Europe yet. But we're going to try to do some things and open up some markets and do some things that um, we've never done and not many bands have done. Um, to us, it's about exploring the world and kind of doing some new unique things. And we think Life is But a Dream is a perfect record to do it. And there's so many places with a huge fan base for you to go. Somewhere like India, for instance, then obviously you're playing the show in Jakarta in a few weeks where the crowd is rabid for heavy music and a band like yourself. So are these the kind of things that you're talking about? Yeah, you know, we took a swing at that one and we said, if you look at Spotify, we should be able to do a stadium there. So we threw a stadium on sale and it sold out. And that is incredible to us um, that things are still growing, you know, at this part of our career. And you mentioned India and India is a market we're looking at going, there's a billion people there. Why aren't more bands going? Well, the reason more bands don't go is finding promoters, finding something that seems secure, something that can be trusted, getting there, you know, obviously bringing a whole crew over there. But these are the things we're looking at now. Like we think that rock bands and metal bands should be going to India more. The same way that, you know, South America and Southeast Asia 15, 20 years ago were not viable markets. Now they are hotbeds for our type of music. And so I think going there and putting in some work and doing more Eastern Europe, maybe even dipping our toes into Africa and then looking at India are the kind of things that are really on our sort of wish list. Amazing. And speaking of global propositions, season pass is something that you've introduced since the last time that we spoke. And just for a blanket question to, to get this out there, season pass, what is Avenged Sevenfold season pass? So season pass is um, a rewards program or a fan scorecard, you could call it, that is, um, you know, it's on the blockchain, which means that um, everything is immutable and you own everything that you that you purchase. So the way I would look at it is if you've ever played a video game or you've ever joined like a rewards program like from Chipotle or um, American Airlines, basically we are figuring out ways to to track and reward you for things you're already doing. And those things include going to concerts, buying merchandise on the store or buying merchandise on tour, attending events. And then within the next couple of months, we're going to be rolling out tracking people streaming. Um, and we won't be doing that without people opting in to these things. So if you want to be involved, you can. Um, and, and what happens is there's a, a tiered reward system where the more things you do, we airdrop people and airdropping is giving um, tokens to people that are good for something. Um, we give them merchandise discounts, early access to tickets, um, free tickets to shows and meet and greets. And once you earn these things, they live in your digital wallet. And you can do what you want with them. And what's cool about that is if you live in a place where we don't tour a lot and you're listening to us constantly and you get through this sort of tiered system, you could sell your rewards potentially to other fans that do want to meet us or live somewhere where there's a show close by or tickets, um, yada, yada, yada. So it's basically a reward system that you fully own on the blockchain and everything you earn is sellable. And to start, people have to have their their online wallet, their MetaMask or, or whatever first. Is that like, that's point A. How else do people get involved from there? Yeah, you have to download a free app um, and then you go to the Avengersunfold.io 
and you click on season pass and then it's just going to ask you to opt in. And what that means is that they are taking down your digital identity, which is your MetaMask now. And then we are going to be tracking the items that fall into that wallet. So that's how we can give you points and we know who you are um, online. And so all that stuff is free. And it's a way for us to kind of give back to people that have gone to so many shows or spent money in the store or have dedicated so much time listening to us. It's a way that we can kind of give back to people and allow them to kind of participate in the upside of the band as it grows and as the community grows. And like the the kind of perks that people are able to get, like you mentioned, like meet and greets and merch, money off and and early access to tickets. But you're going above and beyond that as well, like releasing previously unreleased demos and and some of the other things that are like potentially not so traditional. Like what other perks are there involved with with being involved with Season Pass? Yeah, there's like some collectibles that are just fun collectibles that will only live in this season. And, you know, you can imagine a world in 20 years where those will be cool to have. You were one of the first people that uh, jumped down this journey with us, right? Um, And then there's music that once one person unlocks it, everyone gets to hear it. But there's something very cool for collectors of things, right? Whether it's trinkets or um, little statues or art there's something very cool about having ownership of a demo and having it in your digital wallet or on the blockchain and knowing that you can move that around and give it to somebody or this or that. Now, if you're somebody that says, I don't care about that, I just want to listen to it, that's totally fair. That's not what this is solving. What this is doing is giving somebody the ability to own something that is kind of cool. The same way you can look at a picture of the Mona Lisa, but none of us own it. Um, We're giving you like some sort of ownership over it. Now, in the future, it'd be great to fractionalize royalties of some of these songs and allow that whole thing. But that's going to be a deeper conversation of more things coming online with the blockchain. But for now, these are very cool kind of brag worthy. I have this demo and I, I have one of the 76 that got minted or one of the three that got minted. Um, There's something very, very cool about that. Something that really uh, hit me as well was I, when I signed up for it, I was already at a level 11 and like already had the opportunity to collect a whole bunch of these things and get money off of merch. Is that the case for a lot of people as well when they when they onboard, like they might have more than they might consider that they would have? Yeah, so we're giving a few points out to start. And then also, if anyone is like, participated in the ecosystem for the last 18 months, whether that means going to a show and then moving your your Ticketmaster ticket into your wallet, or if it means scanning a piece of merch and then moving those verified tokens into your wallet. If you've done any of that, or if you even had Season Pass, right, which was a free thing to download, all of those things automatically give you points. So a lot of people, to be honest, there's about 50,000 rewards that have been minted, or 60,000 at this point, about 20,000 people have signed up to Season Pass, but there are millions of points that are sitting in people's wallets that people haven't claimed yet. So that's why it's good to talk about it over and over to let people know, hey, this is free. As soon as you sign into this thing, you're going to have the ability to start earning these things. And But we don't want to have people think they're competing and buying more for this. It's a very fine line. We yeah. want people to just do what they do. And then we want to just seamlessly reward them for just even caring about us or participating. It's just, do you think that it's so giving back that people almost are like, what's the catch about it? Like, because like, this is this is just rewarding for the behavior that you're, you're already doing. A hundred percent. And I think um, we come at this from a very um, sort of pure place, I think. I think if you want to mm. play the strongman argument against it, I would say the reason we do it is because we want people constantly um, engaged with the band. And in the end, that means people are going to, if they know about a show, they might go to the show. If they know about a merch drop, they might buy the merch drop. If they, if they know they're getting points for listening, they might throw our music on when they don't know what to listen to. Like you're always top of mind. Mm. So at the end of the day, if you keep fans engaged and involved, this goes back to, you know, the sort of changing music industry where you don't, know who your fans are. You're trying to get played on the radio, but you don't know who that casual person is. 
We are trying to get to know everybody that cares about being involved in, in this ecosystem. And that's where we win, right? We win when we have people engaged and, and are thinking about Avenged Sevenfold. But the rewards really do come from, there's no like secret back door of like, oh, we're getting, we're siphoning money off people. We're doing, it just really comes down to keeping on top of mind, right? Yeah. And, and like, let's say I have bought a bit of merch in the last 18 months or gone to a ticket and this is the first I'm hearing about it. Can I retrospectively claim those points as well? Yes, 100%. And that's what we're dealing with right now. We've been backfilling everything. So, and if there's issues with anything, you just go in the Discord and then we have Josh in there who will communicate with Verify or with Ticketmaster and we'll get it sorted. But yeah, at the end of the day, um, most people that have engaged with us at all, I mean, if you've bought a t-shirt, then you have points sitting on your t-shirt, right? If you've been to a show, there are points sitting in your Ticketmaster account. And then you're just going to move those out and then we can count them all. So like I said, there's, there's well over a million touch points and only about 20,000 people have participated in it right now. So there's a lot of people that there's just points sitting there where next time they buy merch, they might they may have 15, 30, 50% off if they just go and, and opt in. Mm. And when you're talking about, like, um, this takes us back to, I guess, to Death Bats Club as well. We can kind of bring this into this. But you are someone that's always spoken about are on the blockchain and and that area of te where technology meets being being a fan and fandom and being in a band um like what has changed from when you were talking about this largely while dropping death bats club to now can i ask how that has evolved for you yeah i mean man it's hard to say i think we i think we got pretty damn close on the initial launch. I think Death Bats Club has aged pretty damn well. I think Death Bats Club has rarely had to move directions. I think Season Pass was a natural progression without devaluing the Death Bats Club. It was a natural way to get more people involved on a different pay level, which is free, right? Mm. Um, you can't have, everybody can't have all the perks. That's why Death Bats Club has to be blocked off at 10,000. If yeah. everybody had a free token, then everyone would be at the front of the line and front of the line would mean nothing, right? So the Death Bats Club clearly has major benefits. It also has a benefit of being in Season Pass, which, which, which is a multiplier, which you get extra points for just being involved. But there's two worlds here where you can kind of opt in at any level you want. And I think we did a pretty good job. And I think it's aged very well over two years where we're still here. The club is thriving more than ever. The benefits are very clear. People are very happy to be in there. And the community is just top notch. I couldn't have asked for better people to be involved. So um, I feel really good about where it's at and where it's been and where we're going. Yeah, it feels like the biggest achievement of it is after this amount of time when the word NFT is less prevalent in in pop culture than it was at the, at the point in time that you were launching, is everyone who has got on board with the Death Bats Club raves about its, its value and that sense of community and the fact that every expert is saying that like the future of being a creator is to build community and reward it. Like, it feels like everyone who has decided to opt in on a DBC level feels like their reward is just. I agree. And, and, it, and community is the main word. It sounds so overplayed. But, I mean, you, you, when you're meeting friends and that human connection for life, right, I, I almost feel like an afterthought. At the end of the day, we play a show, but these people are traveling, hanging out with each other. They're having dinners the night before, then they're getting drinks before that, then they're all getting in line together, then they're getting to the front of the barricade. Some of them are coming back to meet us and then they're going out all night the next night and they're having parties. And it's like more important and deeper than the band. And that's all you want, right? Because people are going to like records. They're not going to like records. They're going to go through phases where they listen all day and then they're going to go through phases where they don't touch Avenged Sevenfold for a year and they're going to come back to it. But the constant is you don't do that with friends, really. Right. You you're mm -hmm. constantly you have your routine. You get online, you talk to them in Discord, you have you make setup, you it's a different thing. And that's that's kind of the the coolest part of all of it. And so one last question before we bring in Lance from Amaze VR is you guys are always at the forefront 
of of this kind of thing and of technology and we're about to start talking about augmented reality concerts is that is that something that is so part of your dna that you don't feel the bullets of being people that are at the front line yeah i think um you know i've always just followed the things that i wake up and i'm excited to pursue um i think that's what that's like the the key to everybody, right? Like do only do things that you love. And when you love something, you don't really care what other people say, right? Like, it's like, if you love your wife and then someone says she's the worst person in the world, do you, do you take any sort of like, <laughs> you don't, yeah, <laughs> you go that person, like you just don't care. Right. And I was, you know, Dave Farrell is a good friend of mine. And obviously Lincoln park has not gone without criticism of they, they do kind of what we do. They put out whatever record they want. They've always done that. Mm. And we were at dinner a few months ago and we were talking about life is but a dream. And we were laughing about how we just keep pushing boundaries. And, and he's like, oh, you just don't care about what anyone thinks. And he's like, it's funny because if you were to like make a new song and then like this restaurant's full of like 200 people and you walked around and played the new music for 200 people, is there anyone in here that you would care what their opinion was? I was like, no, look at everybody. Like, why would I care what? And looking at everybody, right? He's like, yeah, you just kind of extrapolate that to the world and you just do what you feel is right. And then people are going to say stuff no matter what, you know? And it's whether it's a record or, you know, whether it's uh, the vision of this blockchain adventure that we're on with Death Bats Club, people are going to say things. And you just, if you love it and you believe in it and you're waking up and working on it every day and you have the right intention, I think that everything's going to be fine. And you just can't. You can't listen to that. It just, it'll make you feel like you're in the mud because then you stop and you start trying to please everybody and take in all this negativity. Mm. And then that's, and then you can't move forward doing that. Yeah. And I, I, just to, to give you your flowers on the point that the quality being high makes it feel like less of a risk. Like if you had an augmented reality show that, that looked like a Sega Genesis game, like yeah. that would be one thing, but it feels like whether it be Death Bats Club or something like Looking Inside, that it has to pass the barometer of your internal quality. And if there's anything that we have really shown on tracks with each individual song is that that, that bar is sky high. If you're buying into something that's technologically new, it feels like you can place your hat on it with Event Sevenfold because of that quality barometer. I appreciate that. And I think with BitFlips, um, Joe's team, it's they they launch a little slower than I'd like sometimes, but it's always because of quality control, right? They're testing things. They're going over contracts. They're making sure everything is just so foolproof that it's not going to launch and just fall apart. Um, and then you, and we're going to talk to Lance here in a second, but Lance is another guy. There's just so much quality control. It's just not coming out till it's right. Um, and so I think I appreciate that. But yeah, sometimes I want to launch things quicker but I need to always trust my team and, and get pulled back a little bit, you know, because I get excited too. Matt, let's talk looking inside. Let's start with how did this collaboration come to be? Um, I don't know about from Lance's perspective, but I know that we got a call from someone at our management that we trust, um, Samantha, who who's always, you know, looking out for our best interests. And, you know, I had some reservations at first just because of where the technology has been and, you know, doing things too early sometimes um, isn't the right look for the for the band or, or the brand or whatever. And she was like, I really, I just, I think this is important. I think it's special. And I was like, there's no way you're going to get the guys to do this on their time off, like do a whole show. And I said, but send it, send it over and let us see it. And um, 
she sent us some things and I, I was the only one with a VR headset at the time. I think Johnny had one too, but I was just completely blown away by it. And then we wanted to get more information about it. And then once we knew Lance was involved, we looked him up and started seeing the things he'd done. It was like, okay, like if we can surround ourselves with people that get it, people that we know don't put out bad stuff with a great technology, then we'll give it a shot. So that was from our perspective, how it went down. And Lance, can I get a bit from you then at that point in time about what Amaze VR uh, have already done in the space prior to it? Because having those concerts, having the examples that Matt could look at, where did that come from? And like just a little bit of background behind Amaze VR would be great. Yeah, so totally. So prior to working with Avenged for two years, we had been developing our tool set and creating what has now become the Amaze VR concert. And it began, I believe now nearly three years ago with Megan the Stallion. Um, we did a VR concert for her, which was our launching pad. Uh, and we partnered with AMC theaters and we took it on the road as kind of a test to see if there was a market for this in, in the music space um, and just, brought to the people and we did a mini tour across 12 cities and it did really well. And, you know, we learned a lot of lessons on the way. And from there we started iterating and brought our time cycle down. It took a year to, from start to completion of that project. And, you know, as you know, working in the music business, a year long production, if it's not making, if, if it's not creating the music, anything else cannot take a year. Because, you know, musicians and artists, they want to get things out as fast as possible when it comes to anything that's unrelated to the music. Um, I come from music videos. And so we are, we've been really trying to get to a, a music video time scale. Um, and we've gotten pretty close to that in the past two years where we can now create a show from shooting to finishing and delivering in about four months. And so for the past two years, Prior to working with Matt and the band, we've been developing this tool, higher fidelity. We are able to create these shows much faster. And most importantly, we're able to shoot artists truly live. And all of that came together for the show that we did with the band. And for someone who's never seen an Amaze VR concert and doesn't know what we're talking about in this space, can you explain how this differs from any other? Because as someone that has consumed a lot of concert media over the years, like it really is genuinely an experience unlike anything that's else that's out there. To me, uh, it lives somewhere between a live concert, a music video, and a game, but most importantly, it represents kind of the world and the heart of the artists that are performing in a way that you can't really get anywhere else beyond potentially going to a concert. Um, but it's its own thing. It's really it's its own genre and its own form of communication. I, I make music myself. And I've been making music videos and, and working with musicians for years. Music to the best kinds of artists, music is more than music. And I think that our concerts represent part of the language of music creation that goes beyond the recording of the music. It's, it's, like, it's like a better version of a visual and performing art um, that isn't as hokey as like a music video where you're just lip syncing to camera. It's a format that hopefully will allow artists to express themselves in a completely new way and closer to who they really are. Yeah, I mean, I, I just keep thinking about that question that Zach Norman gave us that night and said, like, well, how how will you think differently about how you create? And when I think about, you know, when we write a record, we're sitting in front of Pro Tools and we're thinking about two speakers. We're thinking about stereo. We're thinking about how that's going to sound there. And we look at the instruments we have in in there and we and we think about, well, you know, how would this look as a music video? You think about the way you create with the tools that you have to create them. But when you add a new tool in, like yeah. how does the creativity map onto that sort of thing? And so to me, when you think about this medium right now, 
we're sort of mapping on something that exists into a new format. But there will be a new way of thinking about creativity yeah. and music with this new tool. And mm-hmm. so who's going to do that? And when's that going to come? Mm. And we'll start looking at, you know, the same way we would send a letter in the mail is the same way we would write an email for a while. And then you start, then email starts creating its own like um, language and its own way you do things and the way you interact with it. And this happens with everything, with every new technology, we sort of, the, the, the early internet did the same thing, right? We were trying to map our physical world onto this new digital world. And then we started doing things digitally native things that worked better for that sort of medium. And that will be the next thing, you know, and, and so you got to start somewhere. Um, and I think we did a really good job of sort of barely dipping our toes into the potential of what this creative sort of outlet looks like. And right now that creative outlook is a conglomeration of things that we're already used to live shows, video games, DVD, music video, Right. It's like, it's living in this weird world, but eventually there's going to be things that you can only do in the, in the VR space. And so mm. that's, that's the exciting thing that's, that's next. Two quick questions on that, Matt. Just one reading between the lines. I remember having a chat years ago for Metal Hammer with Richard from Ramstein, and they had just written and were about to release Ricer Ricer. And I was like, he said he wrote that record with the live show in mind. That's how they write their records. So is is that the kind of thing that you are talking about in the VR space? Absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the way you write for a live audience is you're, you know, we did this on the White Album because we'd come off of City of Evil and we were playing these stadiums with Metallica and they just didn't translate. It was too fast. It was too complex. It was too, so many things. So we started writing some bigger, more open riffs because we wanted the riffs to, you know, by the time the sound reaches one place and comes back to you, you know, we're listening to, you know, Enter Sandman and and um, Sad But True. So you start writing differently for the medium. Now the question is, well, we know these possibilities and things we can do with the VR. Like yeah. what, what kind of soundtrack do you give to it, right? And so I think that's, that's where this thing is sort of going. Um, it's, it's a new thing right now the biggest hurdle is getting more people to get headsets, right? You get, get yes. more headsets on people and people are going to be able to enjoy this um, because right now that's the hurdle. That's the, that's the sort of um, the thing that makes this whole thing an experiment is because you're, you're really just hoping people have the avenue to be able to, to watch it properly. You spoke about the the challenge is getting the headset on people's heads because there is no way that you can watch this same show on YouTube, on your TV, on a phone, and it can convey the same thing. Is that one of the biggest challenges? Is like it is a chasm, it is a quantum leap beyond looking at it on your television and watching it in a headset. Yeah, I just I know personally for for us that's that's been the challenge is that you know we're kind of at the mercy at the user base and you know there's one headset that costs three thousand dollars and that barrier of entry is extremely high and then there's another headset that's currently four hundred dollars but you can actually get the Quest Two now for the price of nearly a concert ticket so um, it's becoming more affordable. It's just giving people more of a reason to invest in this and to spend more time in it and for it to to be nourishing and be worth being inside of it. You know, I think we're all so heavily nourished by our cell phones now. It's something that I, I would say majority of human beings cannot live without. There will come a point in time where maybe three-dimensional video and 3D viewing is something that we will not be able to live without. Uh, and and it's going to take people like Avenged and companies like our company and creatives to create the kind of content that's inviting people in. 
and thinking outside of the box. And I think that was a really interesting point that Matt made is that like for the past hundred years or more, music has been recorded two dimensionally and it's been created. It's music was originally a form of storytelling and it was a communal thing bringing people together by a fire. Think about, go back to cavemen, banging sticks. And it was about sharing humanity. And then eventually that was turned into two-dimensional recording. What happens when there's technology and tools that allow us to bring back the space, bring back like a three-dimensional point and where people can visit music and people can visit storytelling. And I think that that's the opportunity with VR and these kinds of tools is that it is, it's creating a new shell for creativity, a new, a new way of looking and thinking about how we make things. It's interesting because, you know, I was reading this book that Chris Dixon wrote about exponential growth. And if you think about it, you know, like in, one of the things he brought up was in Back to the Future, you know, they have flying cars, but they're also talking on payphones still. And no one really saw that you didn't actually need the flying car. We invented Zoom instead. And so th these concerts, these three-dimensional concerts almost take you back to the fire pit because now you can, what will happen next is you'll be able to enjoy this with your friend in there and watch this artist and be in these spaces. Um, and you can hear it three-dimensionally. You can look around three-dimensionally. You can touch and feel it in its own way. Um, you can transport yourself to anywhere in the world instantly by putting on this headset and your brain doesn't know any different. It's playing tricks on it almost, but it's taking you to this place. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where it, it does harken back to our most primal urges and, and why we enjoy music in the first place. But yes, we mapped on two dimensional recordings and we create for the tools we were given um, and now the tools are changing again, and it'll be interesting to see where that all goes. Um, and the headsets, I think, listen, I've always thought it was funny that people complain about a $15 CD, but if you go to New York City and buy a mixed drink, it costs $23. And you drink it in two seconds and it's gone. Uh, but they're complaining about, you know, buying music that you can literally hold on to forever and play over and over and over the soundtrack to your life but we throw money away at other things. So yes, a concert ticket, you go one night or you have this thing that you have, you open up a whole new world for the same price or probably even cheaper than most concert tickets now. It's just funny how we prioritize certain things and we don't really think about it. So to take you both back to the fire pit, like how did you go about collaborating and creating that world for Avenged Sevenfold with looking inside? Because now that we've got the principle of how it works, how does it work specifically for Avenged Sevenfold between you guys and what we get in the finished product? Um, I think, you know, Lance was very um, precious with our art. We knew he cared. We talked to him a lot about the new record, talked to him a lot about what we were trying to accomplish with it. And then seeing where old imagery and old songs could have their place in our sort of newer aesthetic to give him all the credit in the world. He didn't come to us with anything lame or cheesy. He understood what we were trying to do. We had talks about other music. We had talks about other bands and what we were trying to accomplish. And I think he was always by our side in terms of like, even going to the other creative people that have to be involved on the team and just knowing when it wasn't, when it was crossing the line of something we wouldn't appreciate and then showing it to us really early so we can make notes, right? When things weren't our vibe or they were too far one direction, we had enough time to collaborate and, and you know, bring stuff back or to go further with certain things. Um, so it was just really, it was really collaborative, but, you know, he, he took a lot of care understanding our brand and what we wanted to accomplish. Lance, what did that entail for you? Like when you'd had that conversation and you've got that kind of blank canvas to create, like where did the inspiration come from for, for looking inside and the tracks that we used? I felt really fortunate. I got to be 13 years old again. My relationship to this album reminds me a lot of my relationship to the Downward Spiral, Nine Inch Nails album, which was one of the first albums that the album artwork 
everything, I peeled back the layers. And similarly, I got the chance to experience that with this album. I went off to college the year that this band broke. And so I didn't have a TV in college and was cut off probably from experiencing this band. Cause I remember like you guys were one of the last bands on TRL to, you know, kind of rise in that final era of MTV. Right, Matt? Yeah. And so honestly, Avenged wasn't really on my map. Like I didn't know much about the band when, when this was brought in to us. Uh, I was familiar with a few songs, but then to sit with this album, it was such a gift because the music is so diverse and is so creative and expansive and surprising. And the artwork that Wes did is running in visually in parallel with the music that I felt so fortunate to be at that caveman fire and the shadows that were being cast off into the wall was like, and the, what I had to work with was just such, such an honor and a gift. And then as I started to research the band more and started nerding out on, I've probably seen almost every live video of them on YouTube, like fan cell phone footage uh, and live, live video broadcasting or whatever. Um, and so I really, really got to know this band before I got to know them and this album. And so, yeah, I just had a very close relationship with the music and this album in particular that I think goes beyond even what we made. To, to give you all your, like both your credit, I think it's super cool as well that we avoid, like much like you spoke about earlier, both of you avoid being cheesy. It would be so easy with this new medium to go down the thunder and lightning and, you know, skulls and Harley Davidson's on fire, right? Like, you know, the the kind of the, the heavy metal 101 type things. And um, what we've got with looking inside is something that's true to the artistic vision. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and that's the um, sort of danger of putting things in other people's hands. I, I can't tell you how many times we've talked to someone that's going to design a shirt or someone that wants to do a video or someone wants to do this or that. And we say, this is where we're at. Don't go off of what you think you know about us. Take some time to see where we're at. We don't want X, Y, and Z. And 99% of the time, we get the generic heavy metal thing. We get the, the exact same thing given to us, and we're just go, where did we go wrong explaining this? Mm -hmm. Right? And so that was very nice for us to not have to go down that path. Like I said, most people, they talk to you, they smile, they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, and then they go back and they do exactly what you told them not to do anyways. Um, and I can think of a bunch of examples. I just don't want to throw those people under the bus. So, um, but it, that's why this was very nice to be able to go with somebody and say, hey, we're, we're stepping forward. It's going to be unlike anything we've done before for both of us, but this is where we're going and this is where we need to lead the people. This is something that we're all going to feel proud of right? This is, this is not giving people the thing they think that they should get. It's giving them what we know they need. Yeah. I, to speak to that, I think also in this medium and in the visual medium, especially related to music, it's kind of endless what you can present. And I think it's important oftentimes to do less. And that has been a big learning curve in, in the shows I've created with this company and then working with this band got to really see it through is like, it's oftentimes what you don't do and what you don't show. Um, and I, I actually haven't visited the show re until recently. I just showed some people the experience who weren't necessarily Venge fans. And I forgot how heavy the experience is, especially the opening and how gripping and intense and seeing seeing people watching them experience it in the same room and there because you can really take people anywhere with this medium and how distilled and dark the show is but also like not not over the top like we're not trying to scare people but there is this looming feeling to it that's very dark 
yeah, we really did something. So I'm, yeah, in the I'm, middle, the middle was all you. Death yeah. is my favorite part of the show. As we're going through that, and the music's playing and warping, and the and the the voices, and then the artwork, all 3D, like the Wes's brilliant sayings. As you go through that middle part, you just see people just kind of holding their breath, right? They're just like, they're they're almost in a meditative state, but it's so the underpinnings are so dark but freeing. It's uh, it's it truly maps onto life is but a dream. It, it really does. And listening to your excitement there, Matt, like kind of answers my next question for me. But this is why that you would indulge in something like this and take the leap into something like this in a way that on this show in the past, we've spoken about your reluctance to be in your own music videos these days. Like it's it's these reasons that it's exciting and to be able to do new things in the space, uh, which includes playing an entire live set because the re- the experience of recording as well must be insane like is th- are these all reasons why this is different to doing a music video 100 percent. and when people say when are you going to release a live dvd i say we just did and they go well where is it? i go we just it's a maze vr that's that's oh. it and they go like when are you guys going to be in music videos we just did it's just we're giving it to you in a way that you're not there yet and that's okay this thing's going to live forever and you'll get there. Someday you will get there. If it's a year from now, you get a headset for Christmas. Two years from now, go back and get this show. It's going to age well. It looks great. And it's if you want that experience, there's no point of us to go do a full DVD when every single show from every single angle is literally recorded on people's phones and uploaded on YouTube. Go watch it. Um, and, and the music video thing, Unless there's some compelling reason why we need to sit in a freaking warehouse and jump around and play a song, we're just not going to do it. We want to do things with stop motion and, and other ways to kind of to tell our story. If you want to see the band and you want to see a, a, a live version, we just did it for you. It's just sitting there for you. Open the package. And I guess last question to both of you, which is, um, as you said there, Matt, like this is there forever. At the moment, we're at a position where people haven't, like, en masse adopted the principle of a headset. Is this a space that has the long-term future? Because it's easy for people to throw tomatoes at it now and call it a fad, but this feels like something that is the long-term future of media consumption, let alone a project as ambitious early on as this. I think there's arguments to be made about if you put a headset on too long, you can get a headache, right? There's some things physically that will probably be worked on. Price point as well. And there's a price point. Um, I have yet to see anything super compelling be invented or stumbled upon with the human race. And then we just don't do it anymore. We work on things. We make them better. We get them closer and closer to mass consumption or adoption. And then we go, oh, that's where we started. And this is where we are now. It's not to say that in five years, if someone just puts on, you know, glasses or you could put on, you could put on anything, right? That just is in front of your eyes. And there is none of that. This concert can still live in that space. It's the 3D space that's jaw dropping and incredible when you're in it. I can, I can, I only see these physical sides that need to be worked on a little bit for some people. I even get it right where my nose hurts a little bit. If I have it on for too long or, you know, you get a headache if like you kind of lose. I mean, listen, we evolve at a certain rate and our technology is exponential. So there's sometimes there's a gap there where things don't quite map onto our brains as, as quickly as we'd like them to, but we work on it. And I think this sort of concert will be compelling for a very, very long time. And it doesn't matter if it's a big bulky headset or if it's something smaller that we come up with in the future, this will still be something that you can enjoy. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Lance, but that it seems like this can map on to any sort of new technology that puts you in a 3D virtual space. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And especially with what we're doing and the way we're doing it, because I've 
I, I'm monitoring all the time how other people are handling virtual production and things in VR. And we are 100% at least five years ahead with the show we made. But beyond that, it's going to be able to live inside this format and map. It's, it's future-proofed in that way. But I mean, similar, you can play Pong on a PS5. So, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah, so, um, or you yeah. can watch a DVD on YouTube, right? It's yeah, like a different. Yeah. It's a... yeah, I think these won't be wearable in the future, though. It's going to be light shot in your eye, and it's going to be that won't hurt, and it'll be tracking your eye, and so you won't be wearing anything. It'll be actually physical light overlay over your iris. That's where probably all of this will eventually go until we actually just plug into your phone and then it's a HUD, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah. but yeah, it, it's, we're definitely on the fringe on the edge of the next version of the internet, you know? And so we may already be in it and not know, you know, which I actually, I believe is true. So, um, yeah, and our, our, our show, this show, and our future shows, hopefully with Avenge, will be there. Yeah, I look forward to our cyberpunk future. Lance, yeah. where can people get Looking Inside? Yeah, so Looking Inside is available on the Vision Pro on the Amaze VR app and also on the MetaQuest headset. Uh, you can uh, visit amazevr.com. Um, we also took a part of the show on the band's last leg of tour um so hopefully i was actually curious matt how that went and uh hopefully this will continue to live on in future ways as well so stay tuned yeah there's um every night at the meet and greets people were talking about how they were able to experience it at the show and they just flipping out they couldn't believe how close they were to us and uh you know some some people were making out with me i guess so it, <laughs> whatever, whatever i can do to help you know Whatever That's it. Win-win, everybody. Win -win. And it, yeah, it just speaks volumes again. Like, you have to get a headset on and experience this. Right. That's it for this special edition of Tracks. Please do take the time to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to this right now. And we'll be back soon with a deep dive into Save Me. We'll see you next time.